scroll through to find the place where you were looking for, but at least it gives you um, that access. So let me um, box plots and they are and setting up things. So box are nice because they make a nice compact um, graph. Um, here, let me can I share a whiteboard? Um, whiteboard. Can I close this? Ah, yes, nice. All right. So a um, box plot. Just allows you to see where um, in relation data lies and how their dis how the distributions compare. So we can see that this one here has a higher min and higher max, but the medians are the same. Medians and the third quartiles are the same. I'm horrible at drawing with the mouse. Sorry. Um, so some of the so this top 70 the the 50 to 75 percent are the same values. It doesn't necessarily tell us which one has more, but it tells us that in the distribution those pieces are the same. Um, so it, it that's all that's the real beauty of having a box plot. If you look at um, uh, box plots and really how they're going to be used normally, you would see uh, financial box plots. Professor, and, um, what they do is they have you that they show you. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, quick question: When I was doing the notes on um, chapter two, the min was mm -hmm. fifty-nine, the max was seventy-seven. I assumed the median is the exact middle number, yet the median was sixty-six, and that threw me off. Yeah, so the median tells you where it, that that would be the average of the minimum and maximum. The median is where is 50% of the data above and below the mean, above and below the median. So it's the exact middle. So we take the data and stretch it out and then cut it in half. So if you were just to look at this box plot, you can see that you know the median isn't always halfway between isn't minimum maximum is halfway between where all the data points are okay and so this these box plots show you um, how the high and low for each day happened and if there were outliers okay so somebody way overpaid on this day whatever it might be okay and somebody way underpaid on this day but um, it allows you to just kind of get an idea of what the spread was for each day. So that's what you would see normally for box plots is statistical um, lists of you know where the data lie, how much people paid each day for whatever stock it is that you're looking at. Okay, that's how it's normally used on a, a daily basis. That's where you would see it a lot. Um, median is just the middle. So the median here. These two numbers don't have to be the same to have the same median. Okay. Um, when they talk about median income, all right, you, you can have an income of zero, and or you could be the Rock and have a media have an income of you know 150 million dollars. That doesn't mean the median income is now 75 million dollars, because I know I'm not making 75 million dollars. Are you? Is anybody here making 75 million? Because if you are, I want to be your friend. Right. <laughs> you, know, um, <laughs> you know, so the median is what is, mo where are 50% of the people? So 50% of the people, you know, we have zero and we have whatever the highest paid person is. Um, we could. Well, well, like Bezos. Who has um, like 
I don't know if it's me or your connection, but I keep losing you. Yeah, we do too over here. This is Kim. Um, it could be either of us. It could be me. Um, I'm trying to see. So I'm on. Oh, I'm on sprinkles. Why am I on sprinkles? Uh, let me get to. This will be better. Professor, are you there? He probably was switching Wi-Fi as to like exit and come back. I had to turn on the video and audio. <laughs> Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yeah. See if I turn. If you have mute. It's amazing how much you can talk and nobody hears you. So, um, that so I've I I had to switch Wi-Fi connections and um, I forgot to turn on the audio and video when I came back. So, um, net worth can have a giant range, and uh, because of that, the median may or may not be the. So we don't we have three different measures of central tendency: mean, median, and mode, and I always like to talk about um, the University of uh, South Carolina and uh, geography graduates uh, in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, they were telling people graduated the mean income, mean starting income was $500,000. At university you have an extra zero oh that's okay I can't fix it because uh, there's you can't go back and edit so the University of South Carolina and I also spelled geography wrong. Um, so $500,000 University of South Carolina geography degrees. That was the starting, that was the average starting salary of graduates. Why was that? In the 80s. Because, uh, late somebody, 80s. because somebody made a discovery that gave them a good amount of money? Um, Somebody made a discovery, and yes, made, made a good amount of money, um, but it was more like somebody discovered somebody as opposed to actually discovering a thing. It was in 1980. It was like 1986, I think, was like when they started, but they were talking about it in the 1980s. So, but that wasn't a thing that they discovered. It was a person that was discovered. Al Capone's vault? No. Far more, far more famous. He, he, we still talk about him today. Yeah. 
Anybody got a guess as to why the um, this was so skewed? Because somebody else asked about skewing and um, median and mode. So these are all kind of worked together. So this was very skewed data. But does anybody have an idea why? Well, yeah, the one person who made the discovery, what, I'm not sure what the discovery was, but whoever made that discovery got paid. Yes, that was, money. yes, so but who, who, was that, who was that person that graduated from the University of South Carolina in the 80s that would have made lots and lots of money and is still making lots of lots of money today? I'll give you a hint. Your kids probably wear his clothes. Neil Armstrong? Michael no, Jordan. not Neil Armstrong. Michael Jordan. <laughs> so he Michael Jordan, from the University of North Carolina. Oh, sorry, my bad, my bad, North Carolina. I usually have get it right. Thank you. No worries. Uh, <laughs> I knew it was blue, and I'm like, I knew it was one of the Carolinas, and I messed it up. So yeah, so from UNC, um, yeah, he made. He started his starting salary was you know a lot more than everybody else's, you know. But they advertised as the average, the mean income, because it looked better than the median income. So, all right, we'll, we'll fix that to say North Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina. Um, and it skewed the data. So somebody was asking about skewing. This is what skewing looks like for this. We had a really high bump, and then we had Michael Jordan way out here. So here's Michael Jordan, still making you know millions and millions of dollars a year, and here's all the rest of the people who graduated in his degree, you know, over here. Okay, they're still not making anything because you know, you know, geography degrees don't really give you much money. Um, so, but it, so that's what skewing is: is that there's a a piece of data all the way to one side or the other that moves the mean. Okay, it affects the mean. It doesn't affect the median, but it affects the mean. It brings the mean way up because of the fact that that number is so much higher than everything else. And that's what it did. It, it brought this mean income to half a million dollars. So he was making, you know, six million dollars when he started, and everybody else was making 50,000 or 20,000. <laughs> You know, and it changed, so it changed the average that much. Okay, but if they had talked about median, they would have said, well, the median income is twenty-seven thousand dollars, and it wouldn't have stood out for anything, but um, it would have been also correct. All right, so this is what they talk about when st statistics lie. It's not that statistics lie; it's that you lie with you, you misrepresent something using statistics. Um, the one that they like to talk about now is that Hillary Clinton won the election with three by three million votes. The problem with that is that she won California with four million votes, and she lost most of the other states. Like she lost enough of the states that she didn't have enough electoral votes. Yes, um, Donald Trump only won those states by narrow margins, most cases under a hundred thousand, but they're small states. So if you win, um, you know Montana by twenty thousand votes, there's only six hundred thousand people. Oh, is it Wyoming or Montana? There's only like one of those states only has six hundred thousand people. I don't remember which state it is. The other one only has a million. So it's not like you can win by you know lots of votes in those states because there aren't that many people there. You know. So, but because each state is its own individual election. And that's what people don't understand. They, they don't understand the. They, they understand popular vote. Oh, the more more people win, you know, we have to. But it's not that. It's you have to win more states, or you have to win enough state more states to have that have electoral votes. So you have to win some of the big states and a lot of the little states. Or uh, if you win the big states, you can basically get elected. If you won Florida, Pennsylvania, California, and New York and Texas, those five states have almost enough electoral votes to win the election. So you could win, you could become president by winning five or six states in the country. 
or you could become president by winning, you know, 37 states in the country. You know, either way is okay. And either way you could win with less votes. But those are the things that we don't think of when we talk about skewing and data and everything else. They, they, they misrepresent what they're trying to show you. I need to go back to this. Is, so does everybody kind of understand skew and mean and box plots now? I'm going to take that. I'm going to take your silence as a yes. <laughs> Okay, I got a couple of people now that, that yes. are, okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go back to sharing now. Stop sharing, no, I don't want to keep sharing, I just... I don't want breakout. Oh, they added breakout groups finally. I don't know how I got to that, but. All right. So these are um, the problems that we had. So one of the things that they had you calculate is standard deviations. Now, you don't need to know how to do any of these by hand because you're never going to do them by hand. Um, and I know this because I've been teaching this class way too long. Um, and I've been taking statistics for way too long, even when I was taking statistics in college, which was before a lot of you were born, <laughs> um, except for Sean. Um, he's, the only one, the only one, he's the only one here that's older than me. Um, but we weren't calculating by hand back then. Like c computers were kind of on the cusp of happening, like the computer, personal computers, and we were doing it on a computer then. Um, unfortunately, the software that we're using costs about five thousand dollars, so um, nobody's going to have that anymore, you know, um, because this thing over here can do all the most of the work that you can do with Minitab. Um, if you can't do it with Minitab. You can do it on Excel. Um, you can also do it in Google Sheets, but it takes way too long, um, and uh, you'll it'll time out before it happens. So you have to you can only use small data point data sets. But um, your calculator can do almost everything that I had to do with uh, Minitab. So, and if you have a free one, it's even cheaper. So. Standard deviation just kind of again tells us how spread out the data is. So it it kind of does the work. It gives us information kind of about the box plot, um, but more uh, it talks about the normal distribution, which we're going to get to in chapter six, um, because that becomes what we are going to do the rest of the work in. Because the re the, the reason we like the stand the normal distribution is because the math is very easy. We already have formulas to calculate everything uh, versus uh, doing this stuff by hand or approximating. Um, and so we'll always tell, talk about the fact that it's um, continuous data and that it is a normally distributed. Eventually, we'll get into chi-squares and F, F distributions, um, which are also continuous and also have formulas built into your calculator over here. So when we're looking at these, so this one here, it's asking us about um, which is the better deal? And we want to be able to compare information. Now, all of these things are different. Like, I have a piano that's costing me $3,000. I have a guitar that's 550 and I have a drum set that's 650 If I was asking you which is the better purchase, I would not say the piano, because the piano costs more than both the guitar and the drums to combined. OK? But if I look at the averages, the average cost of these things, this piano could be cheaper. And if I look here, they tell me that the mean cost of a piano is 4,000, the mean cost of a guitar is 500, and the mean cost of a drum set is 950. So I can see that this piano costs $1,000 less than the average cost, and I'm saying average is for mean, mean cost of pianos. 
and the guitar costs fifty dollars more than the mean cost of guitars. So I can see I overpaid for this guitar and I underpaid for this piano. But still, in general, I'd rather pay five hundred dollars than I would three thousand because I don't think I need a piano. I don't have a place for it in my house. Um, I have a drum set already, so I I don't need one. Um, you know, so those, but we have to look at, you know, how did we do compared to the mean? And then we can look at how we did with the mean and the standard deviations, because I can see how far above or below the mean I really am. So while I can look and say, okay, well, this one is, you know, 900, I saved $300, here I saved $1,000, and here I paid more, I can see that the drum set and the piano were cheaper. You know, well, which is the better deal? I don't know, is saving $1,000 better than saving 300 and the answer is maybe it all depends upon what the spread is if i find that the spread or the standard deviations change how many standard deviations above or below the mean i am i can then look and go oh well this one was a better deal and the they're going to have you use a formula for this which see i can't draw on this and that at the same time that's always fun Uh, whiteboard. I wish there was another color besides this blue. I don't really don't like this blue. Z is equal to X, which is the price of the item, minus the mean over the standard deviation. And don't even bother memorizing this because it changes as we go along. Uh, which seems odd that we have formulas that change, um, but this formula isn't complete yet. Um, it still works in this, but eventually we're going to be talking about means of items as opposed to just a singular item. Um, but right now we're just talking about a single item here. So I have the uh, 3,000, 4,000, and 2,500. Okay. So. I need to get a, um, a stylus. But this isn't too bad for drawing with a, uh, um, a mouse, is it? No. I mean, my handwriting isn't much better, so. <laughs> OK, so in this case, and let me make this the way I usually make it with a line through it. So this is the equation to find out how many standard deviations above or below the piano was. So the Z of, I'm going to just put a P here, so the Z of the piano. All right. And then I can do the same thing for the drum set and the guitar, and I would do the math out. So remember, we have to do this first. So I'm going to have 3,000. Don't type it in like this. Make sure you put parentheses around it in your calculator because order of operation, division would come before subtraction. We want to make sure the subtraction happens first. So I wish there was a way to, oh, I can. It is showing both. Hey, yay. All right, so. All right, well, that's, I guess it's not showing the whiteboard. Okay. Because if I do this, it's going to do this division first and then subtract, and we don't want that. So parentheses, 3,000 minus 4,000, close parentheses, divided by 2,500. And I get negative 0.4. So what this means, the negatives tells me that it's 0.4 standard deviations below the mean. Negative is just a direction. All right. And that's why they have the answer here is 0.4 and not negative 0.4. So you're going to have 0.4 standard deviations above or below. OK. If you put negative 0.4 standard deviations below, that really means you're above the mean because you're doing double negatives. So you want to make, because below is really a direction. And that's what the negative stands for in this case, is that it's above or below. 
all right? Um, and then you would do the same thing to calculate the other three. And then what they ask us is, well, which is the better deal? Professor, yeah. What was that? What is the negative? Can you go ahead one more time, please? I, 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 I couldn't hear you. I have no idea why I'm leaning closer to the the the, the computer either. <laughs> you better. <laughs> no, I don't know what negative means. Can you go? Oh, go? oh you. sure, sure. Negative in this case, so this negative point four tells me that it's going to be below the mean because negative is a direction. Am I above, which would be positive, or below, which would be negative? Because think of um, temperature. If it's below zero it's negative, right? I have six degrees below, they might say six degrees below zero, or, or they could say negative six degrees. So negative is really just a direction in this. You have to go out, don't you there, doggy? Unfortunately, he can't walk down the stairs. Um, can I take two seconds just to put the dog down the stairs so he can go to the bathroom, and then I will be right back, I promise. Okay. okay. We have a puppy and he's not very smart. He, like he doesn't realize that he can be downstairs. He can be outside all by himself. So as soon as I came up the stairs, he ran up the stairs too. Um, so negative is just telling me that it's a direction. Okay, if this had been positive, so um, so positive point four would mean that it's point four standard deviations above the mean. So this one here is higher than the average, than the mean. All right, and so the positive would be above and the negative is just below the mean. That's, that's really all it is, is, it's just positive and negative are just talking about direction. Are you on one side of the mean or the other? And if I come back to this, because um, eventually we're going to be looking at, oops, I can do better. I promise. Oh, uh, maybe I can't. So here's a normally distributed val uh, curve. If it's below the mean, then you're over here. If it's above the mean, then you're over here. Okay, so if you get a negative value, you're on this side. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the cost was negative. It just means that it's below what the average is. And if you get a positive value, again, it doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. Every value could, be, could have been negative, but it's above the average. So it's higher than what the average is. And that's all, it, that's all this does is it explains which side of the mean you're on. Okay? I don't need to see this every second. I know I'm sharing. Sharing is caring. Uh, so that's how you're going to do each of these. And then it's just looking to see, well, which standard deviation is bigger? You know, uh, which is the lowest in comparison to its same type of thing? So which value here, which standard deviation did you get was more negative? Which standard deviation did you get with more positive? And that's all they're asking you to do in this, OK? Um, in question two, they're asking you to create a stem and leaf plot. So a stem and leaf plot is kind of like a histogram, except it uses the numbers, all right? So a histogram. Oh, 
would look like this. A stem and leaf plot is just going to have numbers. I mean, you could turn this on its side, so it would be a bar plot, but you're going to have in a stem and leaf plot, you're going to have numbers, you know. And they're going to be in order. You're going to have them going in up, in, in, uh, up as they go along. And they're going to be in order here. So, and then. And then I'll have a blank one. And then. So, and these here might be zero. And then you're going to have a, a, a graph in front of you. You're going to have a line on this side and this one here is going to be the zeros and this is going to be the tens and this is going to be the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and so what i have is here this is the values from 0 to 9 and this is the values from 10 to 19. And this is the values from 20 to 29. And this is the values from 30 to 39, and 40 to 49, and 50 to 59, and so on. OK? And so that's how a stem and leaf plot is built. But if you notice, this looks pretty much like that. Like, all I would have is that this is turned on its side. If I had bars, it looks kind of the same now. OK. And so it just allows me to see it visually. It allows me to create a histogram, but also see the numbers. All right. It doesn't have really all that much use um, because I can look at a histogram. The histogram is far more visual to see. Um, the numbers are really not helpful, um, I don't think. You know, I don't know why you would necessarily need that over this. So I think um, like a histogram or a box plot is probably more use than a stem and leaf plot, but it does allow you to see all of the values. So um, there's that. Um, and so in this case, they're telling you, you know, put in all the values and make sure you separate them uh, by spaces. And if there's nothing in that group, you would put none. Um, and we could do this right. Notice here, this doesn't start at zero. It starts at 50s and then 60, because maybe this is tests. Yes, see, it's a test. And so nobody got below a 50. Um, and then there were this grades in the 60s, grades in the 70s, grades in the 80s, grades in the 90s, and nobody got 100. All right. Um, and then the second asks, are there outliers? And outliers are calculated um, by finding, there's a couple ways to find outliers. Um, but in this case, they want to find the IQR, which means you need to have the um, quartiles. So to do that, we're going to need our calculator. So I'm going to actually show you how to do this. So you're going to go to stat and edit. This allows us to put in our data. And if you have data in, you got to clear it out. So, And I know somebody asked me about the, the, the app, one that I had uh, suggested. I tried it. I have no idea how. Like, I can't even figure out how to use some of the things, uh, like clearing out the data. <laughs> I put a data point in wrong, and I was like, "How do I get rid of it?" I, I was. It, I finally got rid of it, but I couldn't tell you how I actually did it. Um, I replied to your message. I actually was able to figure it out myself. So. Oh, I good. Good so yeah. far. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I tried doing things, and I'm like. 
like somehow I had like a the information put into the data like I had like I was trying to do the statistics and I accidentally put it into a data point and I'm like how do I get this out and then eventually I got rid of it but I could not tell you how I actually did it like yeah, what I buttons I click that or to restart figuring it out but I was yeah. able to but once I was able to get that out I was able to see like the the standard deviations and all that stuff when I was finally able to do it you have to quit and then go in and, and, and do the work. But I don't know how to take out data points. That was the thing that was driving me crazy. So in this case, <laughs> um, we would put in our values. And we can use this here. And I can just put them in in this order. Or I could, yes. How did you get to the screen that you're on on your calculator? What did you press? OK, stat. The stat wow. button, uh -huh. and then number I one here, that. edit. This allows me to okay. just end, put data in. OK, so all I did was I've just put the data in this. Now, if I go back to stat, and I really want to build this um, uh, box plot, I mean, uh, seven leaf plot, I can sort them, and I'm going to sort Professor, list one. Professor, yes. How can I del uh, clear my? Uh, it's already some of the okay. data. I, so I don't know. I'll show you how to do it. So back in edit, you go to edit, and then you see where it says list one here. If I go up, notice how it has all of my data in there. If I hit clear, enter. It'll clear all the data out. Don't hit delete. Hit clear. <laughs> hit the clear button. And if I hit enter, it'll clear everything out. So if I do that, it's all gone. Hit enter, you said? Yep. So hit clear and then enter. You have to go. Up to the, you have to use the up arrow to where you have list one. So I'm gonna do it on list two, so I'll have. So I'm gonna go up to where it says L2, and it shows me all the numbers. Yeah. And clear, and enter, and they disappear. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No problem. So all of my numbers here are now in numerical order so I can make my stem and leaf plot easily. So here's my stems are the tens column and the leaves are the ones column. So that's where the 50 came from. There weren't any 60s and I see 76, 77, 79, 79, 81, 82, 83, 86 and 98. Right. So all of my data points are in there. If I want to find my quartile, I go back to stat and calc, and I'm going to do one variable statistics. And if you have the newer ones, it asks you where stuff is. If you have an older TI-83, it just will say one variable statistics and then be waiting for you to do something. You can type in list one here. So second list one. And then if you need frequencies, if you had a frequency table, which we'll have in a second, you would have second list two, and that would put the frequencies in. But if you have just the, the 84 um, plus or above, any of the newer ones, it'll have this table menu driven thing, and so you can calculate. And it shows us the mean, the sum of the mean, the sum of the values, the sum of the x squares, the sample standard deviation, the population standard deviation, how many numbers there are, and then it has an arrow going down, and it shows us our minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum. This is our five number summary. This is what we would use to make a box plot. And on the on the um, on the that app, it still does this, but you have to make sure you've hit quit first, and then it will give you that information with all the numbers. So most of these we won't ever use. Most of these you won't use. You probably won't use the sum of the x's or the sum of the x squareds for this. You could use it eventually if you needed to 
hand calculate uh, the F statistics or um, uh, really do that. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we let the calculators do all that work. So we don't need those two things. But so this gives us our um, five number summary and our interquartile range is the difference between Q1 and Q3. So I would subtract those two and I get six and then one and a half times that is nine. So anything that is nine away from the first quartile or the third quartile could be an outlier. And that's how they get this answer here because 50 is more is less than uh, 68 and 50 and 98 is more than uh, 92. Because I have 77 plus 9, and I have 80 plus 9. So any numbers that are higher than this or lower than this could be outliers. And that's what this is telling us, you know, that we have two possible outliers. So I think this is probably the one of the hardest problems that we actually have in this chapter, only because like you have to, they don't talk about how to do this anywhere necessarily, like they do in the, in the chapter, but like they don't give you any stuff. They just go, you go, what is this IQR? And so you have to know what IQR means and you have to know how to calculate it. So that's what you have to do is you have to actually find the stats, do find the quartiles, then calculate the IQR, then multiply it by one and a half. And all of you, not everybody has these same numbers, but I think everybody has 50 and 98 because <laughs> those are in black. So, um, and some of you are going to have one outlier, some of you will have no outliers, um, and some of you will have two outliers. But you need to do the do the math to figure out which ones go where. All right. In three and six and seven and eight and nine, we're going to be looking at um, frequencies, relative frequencies, uh, and how we can work with those things. So, and somebody had asked about percentiles and how do we calculate them. The, sun, the percentiles really, the easiest thing to do is look at the cumulative relative frequencies. And if they're in that range, that's where the quartile is. Um, you can actually look at this. And so if I wanted the 30th quartile, I would have to do point, point 0.3 times 25. And I would look at the 7 and a half number, which means I would look at the eighth number, you know, the seventh and eighth numbers and look to see, well, where is what value is above that? Okay. So I would look at the eighth number and go, oh, 70, 25% of the numbers are below this eighth value. If I wanted the, you know, 42nd percentile, 0.42 times 25, I would have the 10 and, oh, still 10 and a half. So I would look at the 11th value and say, okay, 42% of the data is below this number. It could also be 48% of the data is below that number. And, you know, 47% um, of the, and 42% and 41% and 45% are all below the 11th value. But you have to have it find those things out. Okay. Um, and you may have more than one value that has that, that information. All right. So, the first thing it's asking us to do is make a histogram. So let's clear this out. We'll go to stats, edit. I'm going to clear this data and put new data in. And so I have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then I have frequencies of 5, 10, 5, 4, and 1. And this is the one thing I couldn't get. Um, the app calculators to do was make a frequency, a histogram using a frequency chart. 
I don't know why. Like it didn't seem to have that. It only seemed to be able to be smart enough to take um, a list of. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, yeah, like so. What you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to, you know, you come over here and you go, okay, well I have five zeros. One, two, three, four. Ooh. Five zeros. Ah. One, two, three, four, five, and then ten ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then five twos. One, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, and one. Oops, of course I missed it before. So you would need to type those in and then make a histogram from that because I couldn't figure out a way to do it like this, unfortunately. Because um, I tried. I tried on many calculators and none of them seemed to, um, I have two other, I have two apps and neither one of them seemed to be able to do it. I don't know why. So if you're gonna make a histogram, you go to stat, uh, sorry, second and stat plot. So up here, you have stat plot on the, App, I think there it's the same thing. You have to do second, and then it doesn't call it's not called stat plot, but it there's the it's that first button, and then you have to turn it on. So turn it on. You're going to tell it what kind of graph you're making. So this one here is the histogram, and notice on the new ones they have frequency. See so the other the app ones I couldn't find a frequency chart piece. I only saw list one. So I don't know how to get the frequency thing. So the um, the numbers are in list one, and the frequencies are in second list two. And when I go to graph this, I just click the graph button. And right now I don't see anything useful. And this is the other thing I couldn't figure out on the apps is how to zoom. It didn't have zoom. But you know, the calculator has a zoom stat tool. So this is the, like I said, this is probably the best um, app that it is because it actually is an emulator of the calculator. The others are, took pieces of it. But so when I do zoom stat, it looks like none of these graphs. Kind of like this one a little bit. The reason is, is because if I look at the window, it's going up by 0.66 and I really want it to go up by one. So I want to change this to a one. It just kind of calculates things and goes, oh, this is what I want it to look like. And so now I can see that it has this shape, which is this graph here. Okay, this is the opposite direction. This is, I have no idea what that is. And this one here is like related to, I have no idea where these two came from. But um, you can see that the shape looks like this one. I keep getting an error. Um, if you're getting an error, you're going to need to go to Windows, and the data points aren't showing up. So you need to tell it that it's a um, minimum of something, a maximum of something that surround the data points. Um, you might also have something wrong in your uh, um, your list of numbers. You know, like if it's a mismatch, like. This may only have this may have five and this may have four. So if I did, if I was missing this one and I tried to do it, I'm going to get a mismatch error because there's not the same amount of columns. What is he in? Oh, some kind of bag. Toast that plot. I don't know. So plot one. Second step. Oh, that's, no, I have no idea where that came from. Oh, I bet it came from the trash can in the bathroom. He pulled it out. He pulled it out. So you're going to go to second stat plot. Number one, this is the first one. doesn't matter which one you choose, but turn it on. Yeah. Okay. It should be an off at the moment. You just click over to on. And then you go down and you want to make sure you choose the right graph, which is this histogram, yeah. and then you want to tell it where your information is. 
that my x values, these rows here, are in list one, and my heights, my y values, are in list two. Yeah, I got that. Okay. And then if you go to window. Window. Okay. Window. You want to make sure that your space, your show, your window fits the data, so that it goes between zero and five. Like if I had ten to thirty. How, how do I get to that window? It just says window. Yeah, I hit window and I get the little window coming up. Oh, uh, quit out of. Uh, hit, go to graph first, and then go to window. And that's where I get the quit, error stat, quit. Right. Um. I go window. I wonder no. which. Um, I'm using a 84 plus. Okay, it should work. Um, yeah, so even if you don't, as long as you have the data in, it should give you the right window. I wish I could get. Um, okay, I'm, I'm there now. Yeah. Okay, so you want to make sure that it shows, you know, some numbers. That way you can yeah, I got see the value. One. I get negative 1.4 for my minimum. Max is 66. Yeah, so shorten the, the max to like, because this only goes up to four, so you really only need to go to five. <laughs> and then have the scale be one, because notice everything goes up by one from here's zero, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four. So you want to make sure that you're, you're just going up by ones. And then the minimum, Y maxes and minimums just, you know, have, we know I don't have anything higher than 10, so maybe I go up to uh, 12 or something so I can see the graph. And I look at the graph, and I'm like, okay, which one does it have the most pattern to? You don't even necessarily need to do this to kind of get an idea of which one is right, because you can look at the zeros and go, well, which one has five? Well, this one has five, this one has five, and this one has five. So that's not the right one. The next one, which one has 10? Well, that goes to 10, that goes to 10, and that doesn't. So now I'm down to two. And then the third one says, two is five. Well, I know that this was five, and this is five. So that looks like it could be right. This is five, this is not five. So this one's wrong, so I'm down to one. So you could build this in your head by kind of looking at the graphs that they've provided you, and then eliminate the ones that are obviously wrong. So you don't necessarily even have to build this to answer this question. Um, you can kind of just look at the values that they're giving you and, and just go step by step which one is right. So in this case, these two are right, and then these three got switched. Because here's where that one's supposed to be, and here's where that one's supposed to be. So they switched the middle, the third and the fifth one on you. So, but that's what I would do is I, like if I can't get this to work, you look at the graphs themselves yep. and see what which ones that they build on. Um, part B asks you to build relative and cumulative frequencies. So we know that there's 25, and they tell you you can use fractions. So five out of 25. 10 out of 25. I don't even have to round these down. 5 out of 25. 4 out of 25. 1 out of 25. And then So I don't have to round them, or I could have put them in decimal form if I had wanted to. So, those are wrong. Oh, no, those are fits. Okay. Um, so, if I put this in decimal form, 0 0.2, and then 15, uh, 3.6. So either way, these would be fine. Like they don't care if it's a fraction, if it's a reduced fraction, or if it's a decimal. They'll tell you if they need it to be reduced, but almost fractions, but almost never, especially in stats, do they care if it's reduced because it's easier to see how they're related. 
you know that they're out of all out of 25 so it makes life easier I can do that comparison if I was then comparing something that was 30th then I'd want to have decimals because I can look and see the decimals are, are the same but that's all you're doing you're just comparing values and then these you're just adding them up so this is 5 out of 25 and then this one is 5 plus 10 which is 15 out of 25 and then this one is 5 plus 15 or 20 out of 25 and then 4 plus 20 or 24 out of 25 and then 1 plus 24 would be 25 out of 25 and I can leave it like that even and it's fine with it they don't they're not up they're not going to be upset with me for not rounding okay and this cumulative frequency is what I would use to find percentiles like if these were in decimals I could see that this is more than 50 percent so I know the median is one because it's bigger than zero so it's 50% is bigger than zero, but less than this. So this was 0.6, and this was 0.2. So I know that 50% of the data is one or less. Like it, I know, and I know that 50% of the data is one or more, even though um, lots of them are ones. If I look at this one, I can see. Because if I was to find the 50th percentile, that would mean I'd have to find the 12 and a half number, so the 13th number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, and the 13th number is a 1. So that worked out. If I wanted to find the um, 40th percentile, the 10th number, and I would count through and I would go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the 40th percentile is a one. The 60th percentile, 60 times that is um, 15, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, the 15th number is a one. And so, but actually they would say, um, the 60th percentile would be a two because the, that's exactly the right thing. So we want to look at the next one and go, okay, well, what's the average of this? It's one and a half. So the 60th percentile is one and a half because we want to find the value between those. Usually if, it's an, if it doesn't come out nicely, then it's just that number you round up. But when it's you know that, that number exactly, you take the average of the two things. So if it's all ones, it's easy. But if it's a one and a two, the, the 60th percentile will be one and a half, whatever this is, movies that we watch. <laughs> so I guess that's you watch you know, one movie and then part of the, the next movie, and then you turn it off. Um, in this one, they're asking you to pull information from a histogram. So we have 111 people. Okay, that's where they got all these fractions from. And they want to know how many own at most at most two shirts. So at most means what? Two or more or two or less? Two or less. Two or less, good. So I just add up the values of one and two. That's all. If they said at most five, then you'd add up one, two, three, four, and five. And find the value. And then they want it as a dec as a percent. So then you take this number here. And so I add them up. I get Five and seventeen, so twenty-two divided by one hundred and eleven, and I get nineteen point eight, which rounds to twenty. So you got to make sure you're doing rounding correctly, because they want it as a whole number. So if I typed in nineteen point eight percent, might still give me the right answer. Um, 
it, it, it's weird about stuff like that. Um, yeah, they were fine with the 19.8%. Um, but it all depends. Sometimes they don't want the, <laughs> they don't want the, they can be very picky about where you're rounding to. So because this says whole number, you, you want to make sure you're putting in the whole number and know what rounding is, right? So eight, five or higher, we go up. Zero to four, we go down. So that's why at 19.8, we would round this up to 20, you know, but, you know, to turn into a percent, multiply by 100. So I get 19.8. I could have put in all kinds of decimal places as I want to, um, but it all depends on what they're asking. Okay, they use, and like I said, sometimes they're sticky about this and would have counted this wrong. Sometimes they're not and count right. You know, so you're just better off rounding to the right place, number of places. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with box plots. Um, in here, we can see the minimum is zero and the maximum is 30. Now, all we know about box plots are percentiles. So I know that 25% um, of the data is from here to here. 25 is from here to here, 25 is from here to here, and 25 is from here to here. So I can look at this and go, okay, well, these eights, 50% of the data is from here to here, and 25% of the data is from here to here. But I don't know which one has, because nowhere in here do they say both of these had the same amount of people. Or this one has 70 people and this one has a million people. We don't know anything about numbers. We just know percentages. So that's why every one of these is wrong is because they talk about the number, or the amount of data points, the value. <laughs> They're talking about value in every one of these. The um, um, We don't, this one here, they talk about mode. Well, we have no idea what the mode is. The mode is never counted or shown in a box plot. But again, that's how many of a number, and we never know how many of a number there are of any of these things. You know, which one has more data values? Well, we don't know because we don't know how many numbers were calculated in each of these box plots. If they had said, given the following uh, box plots where the uh, samples were the same, then we would at least be able to pick a, you know something about it. We would know that you know if this is a hundred people, this is 25 of them. If this is a hundred people, you know, this is 25 of them. This is 50 50 of them. But because we don't know how many people there are in each thing, we know nothing about values. And every one of these asks about value. How many you know, how many data values are there? How many points are there in each of these? And because we don't know that thing we can never answer those questions. And here, they're asking, you know, which is more likely to be an outlier? Well, because this here is farther away than it is here, this is, prob this is more likely to be an outlier. Okay. But again, we don't know, you know, what the you know quartile range is because we don't know what this number is in either of these cases. Um, but it's more likely to be an outlier because there's a longer stretch. But that's that's the only reason we can guess that. Um, but realistically, we don't know anything about any of the numbers that are in there except for. An eight, and we need we know we don't even know that an eight is actually in either any of these data points. We only know that zero and thirteen are, because those are given uh, quartiles can be numbers that aren't actually in your data lists. So, Professor, I have a question real quick before you move on. Yeah, of course. Um, so specifically, part A, question two. Mm -hmm. um, I was just confused. I originally submitted my answer as the only, only or sorry, uh, as what's being on yours, only the median and the two data sets cannot be the same. Because right. Because of the fact that it does have the line that shows a median that are clearly different for this data yeah. set. Right. I just don't understand why that one wouldn't be an acceptable answer. Well, 
so 50% of the data is a 10 and 50% is an is uh, is below 10 and 50% of the data is below 8 but that doesn't tell us that we could have tons of zeros okay and then in both of those so they could both be the same we don't know we don't know how many of anything is in there like the mode in this one could still be 10 and the mode in this one could be zero. We don't know what the modes are because we don't know how many of anything there are. We don't even know how many numbers there are in these lists. So that's the problem. If they had said the sample sizes are the same, then at least we have something to go on. You know, we know how we don't know how many things there are, but we know how many that are the same in each of them. So if this is a hundred, this is a hundred. But we don't know that. We know nothing about how many data points are in there. So it kind of then makes it hard to see how many of any value we have. You know, these could there could only be five points in this one. So there is no mode. And this one could have tons of points where they're all, you know, there's lots of eights. Okay, and then a few of each other number. You know, but we don't know any of that stuff because we don't know how many things there are. And that's where the problem lies with modes. Okay, because the mode is the thing that occurs the most often. And we don't know how many of we don't know how much stuff occurred in any of these box plots because there's no count of how many data points there are. Does that make sense? Yes. I am okay. with you part of the mode. I just I'm still I thought that the middle line within you know, the 50 percentile yep. was the median. So, so that, is, well, that is the median, but it's not necessarily the mode because this, yeah. these aren't, because you got to think mode only occur, mode, median and mode and um, mean, median, mode are only the same when they are normal, if there's no skew. Okay. We don't know that these are normal at all. We know nothing about what the data looks like on a graph, like, because of how many points there are we can see this and like we would think oh well gee we we know that the modes are different the medians are different so that tells us the problem and that this has some skewing but we don't know anything else about them <laughs> but, but, yeah just the way they worded it by saying only the medians cannot right. be the same, be the same. That exactly is True, and, it's just and, like out of the four, I see. Right, and, and and usually that's one of those like whenever they're talking about stuff, words like only or exactly like that's you, they're you, those are usually wrong when you talk about statistics. Okay, because okay. that means this is the only thing that can happen. Right. Right. This all this is so uh, only in the medians it cannot be the same. Well, no, um, we also know that the uh, quartiles aren't the same. Like the, we know that the first quartile isn't the same. Okay, I see. You know, Thanks. we don't know about the third quartile, so those could be different. But we know that the medians aren't the same. The first quartiles aren't the same because the, there's space here. Had there not been any space, then the first quartile and the median would both be eight. But this could be seven point six. It could be three. We have no idea what this number is, but we know it's not an eight. That's all we know. So that's another way to know that that that's not true. Um, they could have the same average still because we don't know anything else about the data points. Because again, that has that has to do with adding up all the values and, and dividing, and we don't know how many values there are, and we don't know what they are. So that's but that's why. Um, Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, yeah, and we, again, this is counting of things, so we don't know what the modes might be. Um, and again, they can have the same mode, yes, but we don't necessarily know that. Um, while they do overlap all the numbers, they could have the same mode, but it's not something that we can know. <laughs> So, um, so here in six, they're going to actually actually ask you to to build a frequency chart. Eventually, one of these. And there's a histogram. We'll 
back to that one. Here's the frequency chart, but we want box plot. We don't have it yet. Okay. So these five things, four things, five things, five questions are all answered by us putting them into the statistics. So if we go to stat and edit, I'm going to clear these out. Okay, put the numbers in one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then in the next one, it's three, three, seven, 13, 13, and one. So I put my data in. And now to get the mean, standard deviation, and the quartiles, that's all in one variable statistics. So I go to stat, calc, one variable statistics. And because this is a frequency chart, I want to make sure that it looks at the frequencies in list two. And so that's second. And I know you can't see it on mine, but if you help your calculator, like there's the, the, the blue values all go with the second key and the green values all go with the green key. So like if I need to put a letter in, I would use this alpha key and I would pick all those. But if I want anything in the blue, I use the, the second key. So and it, notice it's saying second at the moment. And if I put in, this is list one, list two, list three, list four, list five, and list six. So my frequencies are in list two. If you have the old calculator, like an TI-83, like an actual handheld one, uh, you would still do the same thing, but you could put a comma in between the two of them. All right. And if I go to calculate, it briefly shows it there. It like very briefly said one variable statistics, L1, comma L2, and then did all the math. Um, but it goes through very quickly and then brings up the information. And so here's my X bar. Here's my sample standard deviation. Here's my population standard deviation. So you just got to make sure you know, answer which one it is. Here's my quartiles. Okay, so it answered all five of those in like a second. <laughs> You know, there was no, like, I didn't even get a chance to, to, to think or do anything. It, it gave me the answer to every one of those, to five, to half questions with one button, which is nice. It's a lot of time. You don't have to calculate, do any of that math yourself. You know, there's no handing, because you could do the calculation. So the standard, to calculate the standard deviation, we have to find the mean and then subtract each data point from the mean and then square those, and then add those up, and then divide by n minus 1, and then take the square root of it. Because the reason we have to square them is because there's going to be some positives, some negatives, and if we add them up, they can become 0. So we have to square them first and get rid of all the negatives. And then when we add them up, we'll get a value. Divide by. In, because it's a sample n minus one, if it had been a population, we would divide by n. And then that gives us what's called the variance. And then we take the standard, the square root of that to get rid of the squaring that we did, and that gives us our square root. So it's a long process, which we could do, but I'm not gonna because it's long and drawn out. Um, if you were doing it with the frequencies, you could find these and then multiply by how many things there are. And then because each one of those things has so many pieces, we have to then, you know, square them, multiply by how many of them there were, add them up, and then divide by how many things, there, you know, how many things there are, and then take the square root. But we would do this one three times, and this two three times, and this three, seven times, and 13 times, and 13 times, and one time. So it, take, it takes a long time to do all of that. <laughs> you know. Or we can just say, hey, calculator, give us the answer. And it's just easier. So even with this, which only has 40, you can see how it can take a long time to do by hand. So they, while they realize that you can do this, it takes forever. So nobody wants to do it.
Then it asks us to make a histogram. Well, that's still just making a stat plot. I go here. It's still on list one and list two, so that's nice. I'm going to make my window go from 0 to I don't know, 10, I guess, and from there to 15, just so it shows everything. And I graph it, and that's what my graph looks like. And then I look at the chart here and go, well, those two are pretty close. Why are they not right? Oh, well, this one's frequencies. This is counts. This is in decimals. OK, this is relative frequencies. And so that's why this isn't correct. Uh, a histogram is in counts of how many things there are, OK? Not the percent of how many things there are. And that's why this is not the correct answer, even though the, the graphs look exactly the same. It's that the y variables are not right. Make a frequency chart. You know, three of them divided by 40, and five, three of them divided by 40, seven divided by 40, and so on. And these may not add up exactly well 40 goes on nicely but it, um, if it had been like 39 we wouldn't have gotten a perfect number here because we'd have all kinds of rounding issues but um, if I did 3 divided by 40 and 3 divided by 40 it would still take this and, and be fine with it even though it says decimal In the fractions, even so, it's, even though it says round to three decimal places, um, where it becomes useful to have these decimals, though, is in these later questions where it's asking for the 40th percentile. I can look and go, well, where is 40? Where where is 0.4? Well, 0.4 is bigger than this, but smaller than this. So even though this Third, this four is 65 in the 65, 65th percentile in the me, median, it's still also the 40th percentile because there's 13 of those. So one of those fours is 40% of the data is below that. One, another one of those fours is 50% of the data below that. Another one of those fours has 60% of the data below that because if we put them in order, we're going to get to a specific four. All right. Um, there's 40 of them. So we'll look at the in 16th, yes. Yeah, uh, in that row, right, where you have the 0. 0.65 and the 0. 0.32, yeah. would like, would the uh, would the three, right, three to seven frequency, would yeah. the three only go up to the 0. 0.325 percentile? Correct. Like so the 30, so, so the, exactly. So the 33rd, 32nd percentile would be a three or less. The 33rd percentile would be a four. Right. Gotcha. Okay, because that's yep. always they're they're always looking at whole numbers. So if you're, they were looking for the thirty third percentile, it would have been a four. Right. Because we're no longer we're now bigger than that, so we're, it's going to be now the next value. Okay, but if we were and if we were looking for the was that a fifteen? So if we were looking for the fifteenth percentile, it would be the average of two and three. But if it was the sixteenth percentile, it would have been a three. Because if it falls exactly on this, then we take the average of those two things, the, the, this one and the next one. Because they're saying 15% of the numbers are below this, and really 15% of the numbers aren't below two. Because um, that goes up to 15%. It's kind of one of these weird things that happen just at these bridges. So if you're looking for the 32nd and a half percentile, it would really have to be a four. But if you're looking for anything between 15 and 32 and a half, it would be a three. But as soon as you get to that, it's this last number, it really now moves up one. And that's the only place where it becomes weird is right at this spot. So if we were looking for the 65th percentile, we would have to look at a five because 65% of the numbers are now below a five. That makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it's it because it, it's one of these weird inclusive exclusive things. It, it it's just at those points. So a hundred percent of the data is below is below a six. 
because but really um had if you any of you have kids um they don't usually go to the, the they don't say the 100th percentile they really say the 99th percentile because realistically one they, they don't know how big everybody can be um i was just came across the story about a six-year-old in Texas who's five foot one and weighs 130 pounds and was playing football and he's basically just throwing all the six-year-olds out of his way um, as he's running down the field. They just see him, you just see him pushing them and he's just barely using any weight because he's like two feet taller than everybody else. And the coach is like, yeah, I have to like use my adult strength when we're practicing. He's like, I'm actually pushing on him because he's he lifts weights and he does all this. So he's like strong, you know, he's like a, 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 a 12 year old in a six year old body, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it's a very strange, so, so he, he might be at the hundredth percentile, but there could be a kid who's now five foot two, you know? So even if there's one person, he's not taller than a hundred percent of the people. And so even he would be at the 99th percentile. Yeah, it might be 99.9999999999. But, you know, they're not going to say he's at the 100th percentile because there could be somebody, one person taller than him. And technically, he's not taller than himself. So even if he's the tallest six-year-old ever, he's not taller than himself. So he's not at the 100th percentile. So that's why they always like they'll give you 99th percentile and say, well, yeah, he's at like six decimal places, but um, you know, it's he's not taller than him, so he's not taller than everybody. So that's why they have that exclusivity versus the inclusivity um, on those percentiles, and that's why we would go to the next one just because. But luckily, they're never going to ask you those, so it's always going to be in this, it's going to fall in this range. Like they're, they're smart enough to know, all right, 65% is going to really blow their head. So we're going to say, what's the 66th percentile? <laughs> they, they, they're not that mean. Um, so, so this table here will help you answer um, I, J, and K. Right. So at least five uh, pairs of shoes. So that means five or more. Um, and so we find five or more. And so we add those up. And that's where they get this value. Like, cause we don't have to have, we don't have to start, it doesn't have to be five or less. It, in this case, it's five or more. So I add up the fives and the sixes. And I could just, because this isn't a percent, it's not going to allow me to type in 14 over 40. See, it doesn't like, cause this is 14 over 40%. And so that's like a tiny, that's a 35th percent. So that's why you have to have the, you know, whole number there. All right. Cause there's cause 35 and 14 over 40 are not the same number. Does that make sense? So whenever they put percent sign, you need to turn it into a percent. Otherwise, it's fine. You could have, if they'd said what, um, if they hadn't put the percent sign, you could have then done that. But because whenever they ask for a percent, they'll almost always put the percent sign in the answer. So they're looking for a whole number as opposed to a decimal. So even point, point 0.35 wouldn't work because point 0.35 percent is not 35%. There's a big difference between those two things. The last question in this group is which of these is the box plot? And if you look at them, all the box plots look exactly the same. So what you have to really do is then look at where are the numbers. And we know that this starts at one. So only one of these starts at one. So you have to go any further than where was the minimum. You know, this is the only one that has the right minimum. But if they'd had right minimums, then you would have looked for the next part. Where is the maximum? Then where are the medians and, and quartiles? But because only one of these four has the correct minimum, there's only one right answer.
so I don't even have to build the box block because I'm looking at them, I can see that they're all look the same. It's just that they have the um, wrong starting points. So those are things you would look at when you're building, when you're looking at multiple choice questions. And this is for any multiple choice question. Look to see where you can get rid of wrong answers and then start working on them. Um, but because this says it's a minimum of three, a minimum of two, and a minimum of four, I know none of those are right. Yeah, this, this, I'll let you know this book is really bad at making multiple choice questions. It's one thing I, I don't like about it. Um, so on these two, again, you're just going to put the data in and calculate them. All right. Uh, we're using the one variable, one variable statistics. You have your data in there. It's only in list one. We don't have a frequency chart. So it's going to ask us for the mean and the standard deviation and the median. So all of those come up. The last one here asks us to do algebra. Let me, uh, two point. So negative 2.2 2 is equal to x minus 1.67. over uh, 3.14. So now we have some algebra. So we have to solve for x. You know, so we have to cross multiply here, go to this fraction, and then add this number. So I'll have. 2 point, I'll have to turn it on, 2.2 2 times 3.14 is that, plus 1.67, oop, I forgot the name, negative 2. 0.2 times 1.67 plus 3.14. Uh, 1. Oops, it helps to have the right numbers again. Negative 2.2 2 times 3.14 plus 1.67. It's embarrassing, I did it wrong twice. So I would get this value. So I'd cross multiply it here, get rid of this off the bottom. Then I added this to get rid of this to solve for x. So it's just algebra. And they want it in one decimal place. I don't know. I haven't seen any of the work. Um, oh, well, are you not, oh, you don't see over here. No, that's right, because you're not seeing over here. All right. Um, there you go. So I cross multiplied and got this value, and then I added off the 1.67 to get this value. So I can't do like you would think you'd be able to share the screen and the whiteboard, but you can't do that. <laughs> it's okay. kind of silly. So let me just go back to the whiteboard here. So I have negative 2.2x .2 times oh, x minus 1.67 times 3.14. So I multiply this, so I get negative 2.2 .2 times 3.14 plus 1.67 plus 1.67 plus 
times 3.14 equals x minus 1.67. So I get negative. Don't you don't round until the very end. 6.9 zero god this is math <laughs> equals x minus one point you try drawing with a, a mouse you'll realize that i'm actually not doing horrible <laughs> and then i add 1.67 to both sides Okay. So those then cancel, I get X, and then this is equal to, um, Negative 5.2. Correct. And they want us to round to one decimal place. So that's where they get the 5.2. Okay. So, all right. So that's what you're going to have to do for your problem. But so you're going to just take these numbers that they have, and this one here because they said it's two standard deviations below the mean. That tells us we have a negative. And I believe this problem is exactly the same. Number eight is exactly the same as um, number seven, except for a couple of uh, quick numbers here. Uh, the mode. You does it doesn't get calculated in um, on your calculator, but you can look here and go. Well, which one happens the most? I have four. I have 36. I have 18. I have 19. I have four. I have one. I have one. I have one. Three is the most. Okay, <laughs> so that's going to be my mode. And then it asks us about how long you should make a um, conference if you're making a conference, and then it's really kind of up to you to, to look at the data and go, well, what makes the most sense? I see most of them are three days. Um, the median shows that it's, you know, four days. And the average, I think, shows that it's, it's another, it's three, I think it is. So, um, but because this number is so big, you know, out of, I think it's 84 of them, you know, 36 out of 84 of them, 42%, 43% of the, um, Conferences are three days, you know. That's why that's one of the reasons they chose it. Um, the rest of them don't make don't talk about the fact that they're three days. Um, four days would be a wouldn't be a horrible choice. I mean, it is 21% of the data, but you know, usually and usually conferences are, you know, here's a three-day conference, and then there's a day or, or day or two ahead where they do pre-conference stuff. Um, so if you said four or five, none of those would be really wrong. Like you're not going to have a two-day conference because that's too short. But if you had said three, four, or five, like if I was asking the question, I would have said all of those are right because the four and five probably include the pre-conference day, you know, where they have other trainings that go on that you have to pay extra for. So. Um, you know, you, you, you get the three-day conference, and then there's an add-on of four days, and then there's an add-on of five days. I don't, I can't see having a seven, eight, or nine-day conference. That makes no sense whatsoever, because um, that means you're gone over two weekends. And, I mean, unless you're planning on going away, <laughs> or if it's, like, in a foreign country. Um, but, like, usually conferences are held at uh, Vegas or Disneyland, and, you know, there's only Disney World, and there's only so much... You know, you can take a Vegas and Disney World. Um, so, you know, because we can, we can all only afford to lose so much money in Vegas, let's be honest. And uh, if you're winning, then, you should, then you're wrong, in the wrong profession. Um, you should be a professional gambler, not whatever it is that you're doing. And in this case, it's the IEEE spectrum. So you're an engineer. You know, you should, and, you know, you're, you're at Disney World for more than five days. You're trying to figure out how to rebuild the place. So... You know, but so if those answers, if I was putting this out, having an open-ended question, and my answer would be three, four, or five are all acceptable, 
you know, but I would then add, want backing as to why you did it. But in this case, because they're showing, saying that almost half of them are three days, that's why they're saying half is the correct answer. Um, and then here they're like, well, why are three to five days okay? So again, you know, this is almost all of them are three to five days. Like if you added these three numbers up, you get 90%, <laughs> 80-something, 80 85%. You know, so that's where they are. And like I said, usually there's a pre-day and a post-day or two pre-days, um, you know, and then people stay over for the weekend anyway, you know, because the conferences will be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then you either go on a Tuesday or a Monday and you take the whole day off and you're in conference, but you're really vacationing. And then you take the, the weekend before and after, you know, because why not? You're down there and somebody's paying you for your flight and hotel. Um, but that's how those two ideas. But the rest of the questions are really just like seven. They're like, what's the mean? What's the median? What's the mode? What's the standard deviation? What's the graph look like? And then the last one, again, asks us to find a value that's 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. So it's this same, um, the, the thing we did with the whiteboard, of course, when I go back to the whiteboard, it'll be gone. You know, you're gonna have negative 1.5 equals x minus whatever the mean was divided by whatever the standard deviation is. And you have to calculate that, those two pieces to calculate do this. That's the same as this problem right here. So we've done it already, but um, they're just giving you new numbers. OK. Um, are there any questions on when your dog is done doing his business, you should hold him up on the camera for all of us to see? Oh, uh, I, we, I put him out, and he ran. I came back, and he ran right back up the stairs. So he actually has to still go out. Um, I'll bring you up because everybody wants to see him. Hold on. Hold on. Let me bring him up. Uh, oh, hi, cutie. Hi, baby. Oh, my God, so cute. You are the best dog. What's his name? Monty. Monty. Oh. So. That was our uh, thing we did during uh, quarantine. We we're like, oh, my son had wanted a pug forever, and we're like, all right, here's your birthday present. <laughs> like, right, it was like, we we like, oh, we're home. Let's get a dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do something really stupid and get a dog. <laughs> So it was like right before they shut everything down, <laughs> you know, um, like the next week, Ma Ma Maine's like, oh, nobody from Massachusetts can come in. <laughs> so we're like, oh, that worked out fine. Um, but yeah, so we got him a little early for my son and that was his present. That was his birthday present. And of course, he's had an ear infection for the last two weeks. So that was great. You know, nothing was more fun than sticking medicine in your dog's ear. I want you all to know that. Those of you who don't have dogs, um, consider yourselves lucky. I don't know. Cause... I have to do that with my cat, which is maybe worse. Oh, well, yeah, I know. You know, giving medicine to any animal is not a, <laughs> a, a good idea. They really, really, really don't like it ever. Um, so, um, but yeah, no, he, he's like, I have to like hold on to him and have something next to him so like he's like pinned against the refrigerator or on the couch and my wife says it looks like a, a prison movie because yeah. <laughs> he's like pushed up against the wall and he's like struggling to get away and it's like great you know not the uh um, image i really want to think about but you know so yeah he's he's fine you know 
but they said everything is good. His ears are clear, so yay. Um, but and he eats. He's already 20 pounds, and he's only seven months old. So they're like, he's getting fat. We're like, yeah, that's because he stands in front of you while you're eating and like gives you this. <laughs> I haven't had, I haven't eaten in like four or five minutes. Please give me more food. You can't say no to that face. Oh yeah, I can. You can't. <laughs> you can't. Don't like him at all. No. Like, like he goes to sniff their butts and they like you know uh, whack him and run away. He can't go downstairs because his legs aren't long enough. So, uh, okay. So yeah, um, if you are done, if you have any questions, I'll stay on. Um, Felicia, you can head out. Um, so that's fine. If your computers are dying or you think you got all this, um, I'm going to let you guys go. I mean, we've been here for almost two hours. So that's pretty decent. Um, a lot of talking. Um, and, um, I will see you all next week. I'm going to, like I said, I recorded this, so I will put it up on YouTube just so if you need to see anything, you can uh, see it again and watch through it. Um, it's two hours of boringness. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing because they don't need to see your uh, the text. And everybody have a good weekend. I have to go watch baseball games now, like today and tomorrow. I, my son has five hours of baseball in Medfield. So I don't know. I thought it was Medford and I was like, yay. Then I'm like, no, Medfield. I'm like, ew. <laughs> so um, Have a nice drive. Thanks. Yeah, it's like an hour. So he's going to be there for two, which means we have to leave here. He's going to be there for an hour. He's going to be there for one, so I have to leave here at noon. So I'm going to have get him up, have some lunch, and then head out. So everybody have a good weekend. I'm glad we can make it. We'll see you next you week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How do I end this? <laughs>